All right, I am here with Paul Hodges, friend of the show. Paul, you are an expert in the chemicals industry. You've been on recently talking just about how recessionary the chemicals industry is, and that's a very leading indicator. So if people want to hear about that, they should watch our previous interview. But today we're going to be talking about one thing, and that is cars. The auto market is a giant market globally, and it was weak. I knew it was weak, Paul, before I read your report. But after I read your report, I really, I feel like I, I didn't know just how weak it was. Um, so you published from the PH report, a very long quarterly report on the auto market, uh, has over 30 charts, which I love, and we're going to go through them in detail. Broadly, Paul, how would you say is the health of the global car market? I think it's it's got a binary outlook here, Jack, and uh, great to catch up with you again. It, essentially, what where we've been is that for the last two or three years, the automakers have understood that there is a transition underway to electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. And so they've actually got to stump up you know, tens of billions, if you're a, you know, a GM or a Ford or a VW or whatever, in order to get into that game. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, auto sales themselves have been falling. So how do you balance the cash flow issue there? And essentially what they've done is they've jacked up prices of 10, 15 percent uh, year by year. And that meant that's meant that monthly repayments have gone up close to 700 bucks for a new car, around 600 for, for a used car. And payment terms are around six years. So we've probably reached about the, the top of where automakers can pitch prices for the uh, for, for new cars, but at the same time now, the costs of really getting to market with electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles are starting to, to really ramp up. So I think you'll see bankruptcies in this area because I think people will see lower income from sales of gasoline and diesel cars. And, you know, it, it takes time to ramp up sufficient volume in the new sales, which, of course, more expensive because you, you know, you're not that efficient at doing them. Uh, and of course, the other thing that's come into play is a supply chain has suddenly woken up and gone, ah, oh no, oh no, you're not, you know, you don't want all our stuff anymore. And yeah, sorry, they don't. So yeah, um, that's, that's kind of where we are as a background. Right. So there's a secular theme of the transition from ICE vehicles, ICE vehicles, internal combustion engines to electrical vehicles. And that itself is sort of kind of a traumatic experience for the car industry because they have to invest billions of dollars to build these new plants. They have to hire you know, totally new engineers. It's a totally different system. But then there's the cyclical fact that globally uh, auto sales are on the decline and uh, sales themselves have, have peaked out. So they've raised prices, as, you, as you're saying, and just they can't raise prices anymore. Uh, we can just show this chart on screen right now of auto sales in the top seven countries. You see that they peaked in about 2018. So why did they peak in 2018? It seems like they, they've been growing steadily after the great financial crisis from 2010 to 2018. What happened in 2018? Well, it's 20, 2018, 2019. If, if um, uh, you know, there hadn't been COVID and so on, we would have been in a recession uh, pretty clear in, in 2020. Uh, you know, everything was overheated and it was only really kept going by the stimulus spending. Uh, so, you know, what, what you can see there very, very clearly is that sales, from, that we take 2005 onwards, uh, we take the top seven uh, countries and, uh, or regions, and, and we, we, those are around 75 or 80 percent of all car sales. So it's, you know, other countries don't report so quickly. So this is a shorthand for saying what's happening in the market. So essentially what you got was the market was doing okay up till 2008, the subprime. The subprime people was, you know, you remember the story, um, house prices were going up, people felt wealthier, and so they bought new cars. So the car industry did well alongside the housing industry until it didn't, and you can see financial crisis, how it didn't. Then, of course, the Fed came back in. Oh, don't worry, guys, boys and girls, we've got trillions for you. And so you got, you know, 7.8 trillion going out the door, at zero interest rates by the end. And then you know, once you've got to zero interest rates and you've got to 
seven point eight trillion. You know, the, the 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 effort involved in trying to push it up further is gets too much. It's just the bubble is is coming close to burst. And so, um, if you if you sort of look at where we are today, look at those. You know, the, the states really uh, you know, began to. If we sort of stick with that that chart for for a moment, Jack. You know, what what you see is that really from uh, on the sort of general level in the states, we were looking at a slowdown from around 2016 or so. You get you know it's month by month, and then you get the 12 month average. So you get the seasonal peaks and the seasonal declines and so on. But really, it topped out in 2019, and it's been downhill more or less ever since. There was a bit of a rebound, obviously, after COVID. You know, people's cars bust, they had to get a new one, that sort of thing. But then it, it's it's been downhill again. Yeah, right now, we're showing just US auto sales. And but yeah, they peaked in 2015. This is surprising. I didn't know that they were an industry on the decline, literally in, in the revenue sense. Uh, very interesting. So, Paul, let's also put up a, just a chart of the financing of these vehicles. So this is U.S. auto loans going all the way back to 1960. And underwriting standards for loans on mortgages, particularly subprime mortgages, after the great financial crisis, lenders, to some degree, kind of learned their lesson. And FICO scores, credit rate ratings of borrowers were quite high. And that's why you haven't seen a lot of mortgage defaults at all. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said about the auto market, where a lot of subprime credit was extended Tell us in the U.S. particularly, you've got a great section in this report, how how significant was the lending against vehicles and sort of giving people money to, to buy cars? How significant was that in the drive up in car prices that we've seen over, over the past two years? Well, you you you, you got into into this this point. You know, I, I wouldn't say that that auto sales in the states declined from 2015. I think they plateaued at that point. And that's largely around demographics. And, and everything else, because you've got you've got an aging population in the states. People pretend it isn't, but the data shows it is. Uh, you know, the, the 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 only growth area in the states in terms of uh, of, of population is the over fifty fives, and the over fifty fives very nice people we know, but they're not great spenders because they own most of what they do, and they're not having kids, and so gradually as they get to sixty five and seventy and seventy five, they're spending about halves compared to where it was at peak at 55. And, you know, they're not driving as much and so on. But what what you saw was that the manufacturers compensated for the lack of volume growth by pushing up prices. And you could do that because just as you could with, with house prices, because the, the actual cost is a capital cost and then an interest cost. So if, if interest costs are high, then the capital cost also has to be low. It's an inverse relationship because, you know, if it's 100,000 and interest rates are 15%, that's an awful lot of, uh, of interest to be paying. But if, if house prices are 200,000 and interest rates are zero, well, you know, that's, that's pretty affordable. So that's why, you know, house prices went up in the way they did. And that also happened, unfortunately, with, uh, with, with autos. Only there was one extra dimension to it, which was that with autos, you can change the, the term of the loan. And so you go in and you see the see the car you want. And you think, well, actually, I do want the speakers. I do want the GPS. I do want that. And they say, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Um, and they, I say, by the by the by the way, um, you know, what, 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 what's your level of income? And you say, oh, well, you know, I'm on 50,000 50, a year. Well, are you sure you're on 50,000? Are you sure you're not up at 65,000? I mean, haven't you just had a, a, a furlough payment? Yeah, I've had. Well, look, if we annualize the furlough payment, you know, we can say, you know, maybe it will come, maybe it won't. But at the moment, you know, you're really on 65,000, aren't you? So we can get you a better rate for that. And the, the, the deal, and this is, this is not just me that's sort of saying this, you know, it's been reported by the people who are supposed to report these things, that the, the deal was essentially car salesmen were getting a bigger commission on the loan than they were on the auto car price itself. So they had every incentive to say, you know, Jack, you look a very nice young lad, and you're, you know, obviously going somewhere at Blockworks and so on. So, you know, actually, when I think about sixty-five thousand, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd sign off for seventy-five thousand, really, Jack, because I think, you know, I mean, you may not actually be prime 
material at the moment, but you, you've got the look to me, Jack, of being prime material. So let's put you down. Yeah, as I mean, prime. Look, I'm wearing a jacket. And Paul, I found $1,000 on the street today. So if you annualize that, I'm actually making $365,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you've absolutely n- nailed it there, Jack. That, 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 that's what went on. And, uh, and, and so you know, what, what you saw was that genuinely poor people couldn't get on that ladder. But suddenly, all the others ma- magically became, you know, pri- super prime even. It was just, uh, yeah, we've got a chart there to, to show it from the Fed. And it's just, just incredible, you know, how this was allowed to happen. Yes, this is a chart from from the Fed showing the uh, credit score of, in terms of FICO scores of auto loan borrowers or, or auto loan originations. Mm. And Paul, what's so eerie about this chart is that I'm used to seeing. I, I know this chart. This is a FICO score chart, but I'm used to seeing about mortgages. And normally, it's yes. a chart that makes you feel good and relaxed because it's a chart about more the mortgage market. And actually, FICOs have gone way up because mortgage lenders have have gotten a lot more scrupulous and um, conservative in, in their lending. Whereas now it's it's showing the exact opposite. The dark bar on the bottom is be- FICO's below 620, and that has ballooned uh, mm-hmm. in, in the wake of the financial crisis. And um, yeah, it, it really is remarkable. So, so uh, yeah, uh, Paul, what is the role of the collateral value where if you lend me money against my car and I own the car, but then the value of the car goes up, my ability to sort of be in, in compliance with the loan is, is actually very good because, oh, you lent, you lent me uh, $30,000 against a $40,000 car. But now, because of the supply chain issues, the car is worth $60,000. So I'm actually doing great. Mm. Well, you, 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 you have this, this sort of virtuous circle, which then unfortunately, during the life of the loan, becomes a vicious circle. So exactly as you say, if you go back a couple of years, uh, you go out, you buy a used car, say you pay 20,000 20, for it, you know, magically, it becomes worth twenty five or 30,000 because of all the shortages going on. And so if you're, uh, if, if you're going in to buy a new car and you're asked to pay 40,000, the dealer not only says, look, come on, Jack, you're obviously top, top, top grade here. Uh, you yeah, know, super prime, uh, sort of material, just we don't have the exact financial wherewithal, uh, to do that. Uh, but also he said, and anyway, you know, the value of the used car is going to go up, Jack. So don't worry about that because, you know, you, 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 you know, you're, you're paying me 40,000. Probably by the time you come to sell the used car, my, my friend, you know, it will be worth 40,000 itself, which is a great story at the time. But now, of course, um, used car prices are down about 12%. So now the virtuous circle has become vicious where you're paying top dollar. Your interest rate has gone up and the value of your collateral, your car, when you go to sell it, is going down. This has the look to me of what happened in, in the housing subprime market. And I, you know, I guess we're, you know, three to six months just away from that becoming, you know, consensus view. Right. So the old adage of the car loses 20 percent or 30 percent of its value as soon as you drive off the lot, that always held true, except actually during the pandemic when cars literally became like an investable asset that they would continue to appreciate in value. That was a a delay from reality. We're back to reality where cars are not an asset, really. They are a product, a service that you use and they appreciate over time. Uh, yeah, so so you said we're three to six months away now that the car prices have started to fall. Okay, so we, we get the liar, the liar loans, the uh, ex- extension of, of credit to people who were not able to service the debt unless the value of the collateral of the car keeps on rising. Now the value of the collateral is no, no longer rising. How, yeah, how do you think the next uh, uh, year goes? Well, now, now, now you, if you're an automaker, you have a, you have a, a real problem because your market, as you saw, and it's not, it's not just in, uh, in, in the States. It's also true, you know, even more so, uh, in Europe, uh, because of the invasion, but also in China, uh, because China is in a desperate uh, economic state. I mean, you don't hear that on Wall Street. They keep telling you, oh, it's, it's bound to recover. But, well, I can tell you, there's absolutely no sign of recovery from what we see and talking to the people we talk to. So sort of CEOs from Western companies in China. So, um, what you've got now is you've got the big ramp up in spending. And if I can take a minute, Jack, to explain something, what we're doing is we're changing the whole way that we're going to treat mobility. Because up till now, we've had 100 years, well, 100 years ago, we swapped from horse-drawn transport to uh, Henry Ford and, and autos. 
And we nearly went to electric vehicles, but Henry Ford decided he liked gasoline, so we went to internal combustion engines, ICEs for short. And so we've been there for a 100 years. Now, for various reasons, we're moving away from that. And we've got legislation in place, for example, in California, which is the largest market in the States, 12% of the market, and another 20% or so of the market follows California. So in other words, a third of the market is now say that has to move to electric vehicles by 2035. Now, if you step back from that for a moment, what that means is when you get to 2030, a bright young thing like yourself, Jack, you're going to turn up to buy a car and they're going to say, oh, we've got this good deal on an ICE. And you're going to say, I don't want to buy an ICE because it's going to have zero value in five years time. You know, new sales are going to be banned. I, will, I need an electric vehicle. Now, that actually gives the automaker a problem because the if, if you look at what we are with the, with the ICEs, they're an oligopoly because engine technology is actually key. Electric vehicles, you know, if you ever decide to leave Blockworks and I leave uh, New Normal Consulting, we could set up our own little um, electric vehicle uh, manufacturing and we could get, you know, 50,000 loyal subscribers from, uh, for, from Forward Guidance and we could sell cars to them and we could make money because actually it's not that difficult to make electric vehicles. It's an assembly job and you've got to buy a battery. But whereas a car has over 2,000 moving parts, a battery driven car is about 20. So it's, it's really, you know, you, you, there's issues you've got to cope with, but they're not that difficult. So that then says, if you are a major car maker, saying that you're going to go into electric vehicles doesn't work. You haven't got a business in five and 10 years time. Your only business is if you can change the terms of this. And that's where autonomous vehicles come in. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I never want to get into a you know, driverless car. I'm not going to do that and so on. OK, fine, that may be right. But from an automaker's point of view, you have to go for autonomous vehicles. You can't stop at electric vehicles. So you make two changes. One is you've got to electrify your, your plants. Secondly, you've got to go into what I would call a smartphone market for mobility, because essentially when you've got autonomous vehicles, if the system works, then what you're going to be able to do is to call up on your smartphone the AV and it's going to be there and you, you'll pay a monthly subscription. So you can say, I want a subscription around Queens. I want a subscription around New York City. I want a subscription that takes me up to Boston, whatever it is, in the same way that you do with a roaming package. So, so the, um, the business, the car business now becomes a software business. And to give you an example, VW uh, in Europe, who are going down this track very fast, along with GM and Ford and Fiat and so on, and Chrysler, you know, they, they are now employing more software engineers in Germany than SAP. You know, so it's really, so this means that you're going to get, I mean, the soft, the, the, uh, you know, the, the parts people are clearly right to, you know, uh, jump up in arms, bit late for them to notice, but you know, you don't need all these parts anymore. You need some parts, electrification parts, but that's about it. But most parts you don't need, and you don't actually need all these big factories anymore. What you need now is software engineers. So you know, you're going to have labor labor union problems. You're going to have um, you know, uh, you're, you're going to have soft part supplier problems. You're going to have a whole range of political issues as all this becomes clear. Plus, you've got to put a lot of money into it to do it at a time when you're, as you've seen, the major market that you've got today is in decline. So this is not an easy place to be. So that's on the secular theme, the move from uh, internal combustion engines to electric vehicles is a tough one. So tough, as a matter of fact, you're saying that they need to go autonomous. There are a lot of long-term thoughts in there, technological that, that uh, let's get into later. But just, Paul, going back to bankruptcies, how bad do you think this is, this is going to be? And in particular, in sort of the, 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 the default cycle, you know, Ally Financial, for example, which a lot of people mm. cite as an example of the deterioration of credit quality. Yes, their charge-offs in terms of your, their, the money that they're setting aside for credit mm. losses on auto loans, they're on the rise and they're on the rise sharply, but they're still below 2019 levels. So it's on an absolute mm. level, it's, quote, not that bad. But the rate of change yeah. is, is looks uh, horrific. So 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, just on the on the sticking purely on the cyclical level, what what do you see? And then, which company is going to go bankrupt? I mean, I mean, it's probably just a bit too early to be clear who's going to be bankrupt. I mean, uh, Robert Bosch, for example, uh, in the parts area, has suddenly woken up to the fact that many of the parts that it sells at the moment won't be needed, and so it's starting to go into M and A. So uh, and that, that's sort of typical of this stage, that the rather sleepy companies who, who kind of knew this was going on and did presentations about it and so on, but didn't actually do anything about it, are now waking up. Now, it may be that their, their acquisition, acquisitions work out well and they hope to provide the cash flow for them. Uh, my guess is that you know, we'll, we'll know this in, in three months' time. This is why we do a, a three-month update. What we're doing at the moment is we're saying – Please pay attention to this. You know, autos is the largest manufacturing industry in the States. It's the largest manufacturing in the world. It's got industry in the world. It's got an enormous number of subcontractors and, you know, em employees in other areas. No, not just, you know, the, the, the sweet shop and, and so on, uh, and the, uh, 7 Eleven and the Starbucks that service all the uh, all the workers and so on, an immense amount of employment and so on. And all of that is now at risk. And that's really my point today. You know, I think in three months' time, if we come back and look at it, we'll start to see who the winners and losers are. But what I'm trying to do really, Jack, is to give you a heads up to say, look, pay attention here. Uh, this is going to be very big. It's rather like, you know, if we were, if we were talk been talking about the housing market in 2007 going to, into 2008, we'd have been saying, guys, there really is going to be a major problem here. We did actually say that uh, in the Financial Times and elsewhere. It was, wasn't just a theory. Uh, was, but you couldn't be sure at the end of 2007 who exactly would go bust. But by March, when Bear Stearns went, you knew who was going to go bust. Now you've got it clear. And so we're in that sort of, you know, in three months' time, we'll be pretty clear about who the winners and losers are. We'll certainly be clear about the losers uh, in it. Uh, the winners will take a bit longer to work through. Paul, you, you write that you can assume that we'll see the same pattern now in autos as at the end of the, the subprime collapse. So, Paul, in the prior financial crisis, U.S. auto sales declined from 1.4 million to under 900,000. Do you expect a similar level of slowdown in activity, particularly as, as you note in the PH report, that auto loan interest rates are higher than they've been since uh, 2001? Well, if you, you know, I, I, I think, you know, looking back in history is always a good idea. And, you know, this seems to me to parallel the subprime housing crisis. And if you looked at housing starts, they dropped 73 percent between the peak of, uh, of subprime in 2005 and the trough in 2009. So they went down 73%. I think that's probably a reasonable estimate for the downturn in auto sales because you've got the same kind of backdrop going on. You know, car pr prices now for used cars are falling, interest rates and therefore the cost of borrowing is, is going up. If you look at uh, uh, financing, 84%, eight, more than four in five consumers need financing in order to buy a new car. And currently today, uh, just under half, about 40%, need it for buying a used car. That's because they, they, they've got capital tied up in their new car and they can just transfer it if they want to into a, into a used car. But if, and if the value of the used car keeps going down, of course, that, that, that may balance out for them or it, or it may not. But essentially, what you've got, and you can see this in the Fed's senior loan officers, you know, what do banks do? When, they, when, you know, when it's sunny, they lend you an umbrella, and when the rain comes, they take the umbrella back. So they were perfectly happy to give you all sorts of liar loans and so on. Sorry, not a liar loan, of course, it was just a, a, just, just a slightly optimistic view of, uh, of Mr. Farley's potential. And then um, when they look more closely at Mr. Farley, and they say, wait a minute, he's got a suit on, but he hasn't got a tie. Well, ah, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Come on, Jimmy, let's get this one. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and so the, the, the balance shifts. Thanks, Paul. Now let's, let's move on to China, where you're seeing a slowdown in autos as well. 
But within it, you're seeing a massive transition from internal combustion to, to electric vehicles. So what are the major themes within the Chinese uh, auto market and how do they relate to the overall Chinese economy, which, as you correctly have been pointing out for much of this year, is already in a recession? Well, I, th- I think the, the, the Chinese auto market is fascinating because if you go back to 2000, you know, there were hardly any cars in the, uh, in, 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 in the Chinese, Chinese market. So we can sort of pull up that, that slide. So you, you look, you look back and you're selling, you know, even in, uh, in two, 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 2009, you're only selling half a million cars a month. If you go back, uh, in time to 2000, you've only got 15 million cars on the road. Only 15 million. Everybody rides a bike. It really are. And even, even, even in, uh, uh, in, in 2005, uh, as, as you can see, uh, you're, you're only, only selling about a quarter of a million cars a month. So, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, what was it that suddenly meant sales went fourfold up from half a million or so a month to 2.2 million at their peak? And the answer was this fantastic stimulus. And, you know, all the investment banks and so on said, oh, you know, China has become middle class. We've had that conversation before. We don't need to go on it. Of course, it hasn't become middle class. You know, uh, household uh, disposable income uh, is, is only five, $5,000. This isn't middle class. It's, it's a ridiculous idea. But nobody wanted to, ch- to challenge this. Um, the, I- the idea was there. It was a fantastic opportunity. Let's go for it. But what you see is that 2018, the market actually peaked, 2018, 2019, and it came down. And it's been going, but China is interesting because it's, it never had an auto industry. You know, if you go back in time, cars basically were junk and they lasted, if you were lucky, three years. The average lifetime of a car in the States and Europe is about 12 years. You know, many cars you know, last for 20 years. You know, very few cars in China, even being repaired uh, many times, lasted more than five or six. But what happened was two things. One was the Western car makers came in because China became the biggest source of growth. So all the big boys came in, VW, GM, Ford, and so on. This was where you could get growth. This was where you could get good profits because speculative housing sales were going up. So people had money in their pockets and they wanted to have a shiny new car to impress the neighbors. And secondly, uh, they then, and, and this was forward thinking, on, on the part of the Chinese, Chinese government, they realized around 2014, 2015, that pollution was really one of their big problems. And you know, PM2 levels and so on, PM25 levels rather, very, very high. They closed down the uh, factories, they closed down coal fire power stations in the big cities. But after that, when they did this, the analysis, they realized if you continue to grow ICE cars, gasoline and diesel, you're going to have a massive and increasing pollution problem. So what can we do about that? Well, coincidentally, we could not only start to move to electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, but hey, wait a minute, we can go from being the back boys with nothing to nothing to sell anywhere, really, even, even our used cars are, are junk and nobody's going to buy them. Uh, now we can actually become a really manufacturing powerhouse here. And this, this is the main in China uh, syndrome and, of course, the software syndrome. So China from 2015, 2016 has been moving very quickly into electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles now. And it's, you know, uh, it, it's, it's got a few less restrictions, shall we say, than the states. So some of the videos that you see of autonomous vehicles going around the streets, you think, <sighs> well, yes, it's better them than me. Um, you know, they kind of sort of accelerate down the road with a mother crossing, crossing with a baby. And they, they obviously haven't got plugged into the algorithm. The idea that may, the baby might throw something out of, of the buggy and the mother might stop to pick it up. You know, as far as the algorithm goes, yeah. the mother's over there until she isn't. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the algorithms that GM and Cruz are using in San Francisco, for example, are, you know, m- very much better. Um, yeah. But there's some very good, uh, Neo, for example, spelled N-I-O, very, very good uh, videos that I've seen. And it's it's one of the big expanding uh, companies. So it's building. So, so China's auto market is undergoing an enormous transition to electric vehicles. The composition 
from internal combustion engine to electric vehicles is uh, transforming at a, a very rapid clip. Just to give you an example, so this, this data is from the your pH report. Internal combustion engine sales are down 8% in 2022 versus the last year. But during the same year, electric vehicle sales are up 86%. Uh, over uh, mm -hmm. relative to 2021. And we can actually put up this chart of the composition of China's auto market. Electric vehicles are just exploding higher. And people who can't see, this chart starts in 2019. So from 2019 just to 2022, it's been an enormous growth in electric vehicles. So that sounds good. But Paul, my question is, if the Chinese economy is undergoing a recession, and you know, you said the Chinese middle class, that you know, five thousand dollars. How can they exp afford the Teslas? I don't. I don't. I think Teslas cost a little bit more than five thousand dollars. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not here to, uh, to to talk about Tesla because I think you know it's an awful lot of uh, of promise and not a great deal of performance. Now, it's a reasonable car. I've talked to people who like it, who, who drive it, and so on. It is what it is. But all this stuff about oh, we're doing level four, oh, we're doing level three, oh, we're going to take over the world, oh, we're going to be every taxi service in the world. I mean, it's just r ridiculous rubbish. Um, and you know, it, it, it's about time that it was called out. But it, you know, somehow uh, he, he seems to be uh, fl uh, f free, free of, uh, of of serious criticism. Uh, but there are companies who are moving down this track. And in a couple of years, uh, you know, not, you know, Jet, you know Musk you know, said by 2020, I'm going to be doing all these things. Well, it's 2022 and he hasn't got near it. He's actually now moving, reportedly, engineers from Tesla into Twitter. So, you know, it's, it's going backwards, I think, rather than forwards. Uh, but there are, you know, and that, I think when I talk to people, that often confuses people because you've got an awful lot of noise from the bubble stocks like uh, Ark, uh, you know, Kathy Wood and, and Elon Musk and Uber and so on, all about how they're going to take over the world, they're going to do all these great things, which is great on PowerPoint, but not good on reality. And, you know, it reminds me, in the uh, old, older viewers may remember in the 90s, uh, if, you, if you had a, a, a Windows machine, uh, you had the blue screen of death. And, you know, you got, you got the first version of Windows 95, or you even had, you know, DOS or whatever before that. And you saved every 10 minutes because suddenly it was just software glitch and gone. And we used to laugh about that and say, it's all very well for software on the West Coast, but it wouldn't work if you were selling cars. Well, yes. Musk has, in, has brought along and Uber have brought along the West Coast approach to selling software to cars. And would you believe it? Actually, people are a bit more picky about what happens with their car. If it stops or it starts accelerating wildly and so on, they tend not to be as tolerant as they are of a blue screen of death. But, you know, that, so that's a distraction. But if you, if you look at what China is doing and, and coming back to your question, what you can see is that if you move to autonomous vehicles, not many people are actually going to own a car. Because why would you? Why would you pay? You know, in, in, in China, the equivalent of $20,000, you know, in the States, $40,000. Why wouldn't you go to a subscription model? And companies like NEO, the CEO, and we quote this in the report, have said, we are only going to sell on a subscription model. So in other words, your mobility becomes affordable in just the way that the smartphone became affordable. And the reason why smartphones went from, you know, five or 10% market penetration to close, close to, close to a hundred was that you could buy them a, a, on a, on a, on a bundle on, on with a monthly payment. You didn't have to stump up, you know, a thousand bucks up front. You could pay 20 bucks or whatever it was you could afford. And that's what's going to happen with autonomous vehicles. So it will be affordable in China. Okay, so Paul, you're saying the long term theme is autonomous vehicles. And under that model, people don't really have a need to own an individual car, you can just kind of, it will be Uber for everything, except there's no driver, but uh, not to give Uber any, any free advertising. But what about the timeline, Paul, because, you know, I watched the show Silicon Valley that came out like 2014. And there were talking about autonomous, there were, there were autonomous vehicles that appeared in that show. Uh, that's almost a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I, I believe you that this trend is going to happen, but I think it makes a huge difference as to whether this trend happens by 2038 or 2028 or 2024. So, so what's, what's the sort of your prognosis on how quickly, uh, the, how quickly will the electric vehicles sort of dominate to hundred percent and how quickly will autonomous vehicles dominate to hundred percent and, and do those timelines differ? What you're looking at is that China has now made 
you know, it, it had a target of 20% of EV sales by 25. Uh, in fact, it's going to make that target this year and exceed it. And what we're talking about here is the good old fashioned S curve, where you start going along here and, you know, every year we have a chat about it and so on. And you say, well, what's, what's new in electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles? And I tell you, well, it was quite exciting. So you say, but yeah, but you're still only selling five. No, 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 I'm selling six now. You know, and, and, and everybody switches off, if you like. And then one day something happens to change that, 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 uh, that, that trajectory. And then it goes up like the S curve. And what, what's happened at the moment? I mean, the International Energy Agency has pointed out that EV sales worldwide are now rising 68% all the time, while, as we talked about, ICE sales are going down. So there really is quite a big shift coming in. It's early days yet, but one of the key this issues is how do you recharge the battery? You know, if, if you're the driver, you have to find somewhere to recharge it. That's fine. But if you don't have a driver, what happens? To which the answer has to be battery swapping stations. In other words, you, the, 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 the car manufacturer has to have a standard battery for all their, 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 all their, all their cars. So that when you need, when the, the car knows that it's getting down to the last 15, 20 miles or whatever, whatever it wants to do. And so it reverses itself into the, uh, the battery swapping station. It takes a minute or so. It gets the new battery. And of course, that's very good because it means you can upgrade the battery without the, 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 the punter, the owner, thinking, well, wait a minute, I paid 3000 for this battery. I've got to keep it going. You, know, the, 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 you can you can recycle it and, and upgrade in use. So that bit of the infrastructure is absolutely key to, to making this work. And the Chinese are well ahead in this area. And they're working with people like BP and so on in China. And NEO are doing this now in Europe. So they're hitting the targets there. Uh, and that's one of the things we, we can see that that is happening in the States. Um, what, 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 what's happening is that there it's being positioned. You know, people are looking at AVs to go to Uber, for example, Uber drivers. And so you're going to give Uber drivers a, a, a rest, if you like. But of course, in the end, you don't need an Uber driver. So, you know, this is just a temporary halfway house, really. So I think the States is a bit behind, but the States has been hard behind in all this area. China's been the lead since 2015. Europe caught up really because it had to, because of Dieselgate, 2015 Dieselgate, writing's on the wall now for diesel cars, main thing in, 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 in Europe. So they had to all move. So 2017, 2018, they began to follow China in that area. And then 2020 or so, then GM and Ford. And of course, what you've seen in the last sort of year or nine months since the invasion is that you now not only have a concern about the environment and net zero, you know, many people in the States do believe in this, despite what you read, but many people don't. But you also have the sense of we do not want to be held ransom by people like Putin. And so the International Energy Agency, which in the past was always saying the answer to a crisis was to invest in more oil and gas drilling, is now saying, no, the answer to this crisis is actually to invest in more renewables and more recycling of plastics. So suddenly you're now getting the the, the, the motive forces in, in position, for example, for, uh, really for moving up the S-curve quite fast. Paul, so now we're showing a chart from the PH report of the percentage of cars that are sold that are electric vehicle from the top seven. Uh, interestingly, I wonder if, if those top seven are European countries, which might be a little bit overrepresented because there's actually there's no growth there, whereas a country like India. But but setting that aside, what percentage of cars sold now are autonomous vehicles? Is it 1%? Is it 0%? And then, yeah, I mean, I, I, at what point, if like you say, you know, by 2030, you expect at least 30, at least uh, 50% of cars to be electric vehicles, perhaps it's higher. At what point do you think we'll get to that point for autonomous vehicles where they're at least 50%? Because we're, we're, it's pretty well, early stages for autonomous, in terms not, maybe not in terms of the technology, but in terms of adoption. Well, what, 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 you're, what you're looking at, so just to come back on your question of which are the top seven, top seven are China, the States, Europe, Japan, Russia, Brazil, and India. So they're all in there. And that's the uh, that, that that's the forecast for 
uh, for the second half of this year that we're, we're already uh, up at around 15%. Uh, growth of, of sales, not of car, not, not total, not a total car park and car fleet, uh, but of sales. We're up there and we're, mo- we're moving up now, uh, towards the 20%. And the IA, are uh, you know, are very comfortable, uh, with that, with that forecast in their latest report on this. So, you know, so we, we can see that moving forward pretty fast, I think, over the period. And of course, you've got, it becomes easier. The fewer sales you sell, of um, uh, of ICEs, the, you know, you, if you just hold steady at EVs, but of course most countries are giving you uh, discounts and subsidies and so on to buy an EV uh, because of, because of public policy. Uh, so uh, so that means I mean somewhere like Norway, you know, is is up you know around eighty uh, percent because of the, the subsidies that are giving, even though they're an oil exporter, uh, an oil producer. So. Um, no, so you're getting some, some, some pretty big shifts going, going on here. As you say, India, well, India is a very small market anyway, uh, you know, for cars and everything, because India is incredibly poor, you know, so GDP per capita of two, two, two and a quarter thousand or something, 2,200. So, you know, it doesn't sell many cars. It won't. But what it is doing, because it has a massive pollution problem, uh, partly from wood, wood, wood burning fires and so on, of course, uh, but also from the you know, two wheelers, Two wheelers and three wheelers, rickshaws and so on, uh, they are 75, 80 percent of the market. And it's actually with today's, uh, gasoline prices, it's actually much cheaper for a rickshaw driver to have a, an EV than it is to have an, have an ICE motor. And he can do battery swapping so he doesn't have to buy the battery for straight up and so on. So you're seeing very fast conversion in the Indian market, which is being encouraged by the, by the uh, by, by the government, and you know, I don't really mind if we're talking about mobility, electric vehicles. If your market is m- motorbikes and rickshaws, let's convert those. If your market is uh, a bit more upmarket, let's convert those as well. Right, but uh, and so what about the timeline for uh, autonomous vehicles? Because I think electric vehicles have existed, I think, for over a hundred years. And in fact, in two thousand, uh, GM had a model that they scrapped. So the technology can exist for a while without without mass adoption. So you know, what, what's your sort of timeline for uh, uh, the adoption of autonomous vehicles? With the caveat that, of course, this is an unknowable future, and you know, definitely we have can have a, a plus or minus, a, 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 you know, a confidence interval. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it seems to me like the, the timeline matters a great deal, right? Because if if what you say comes true by twenty forty, then history and industry could play out an entirely different way than if it comes true by twenty twenty six. Well, you see, I, I'd say that's why we spend quite a lot of time on China, because um, Ch- China has, as I say, several reasons for doing this. One is its population is actually relatively poor. And so if you want to expand mobility, a, a smartphone model for uh, mobility is far preferable than asking people to, uh, to spend you know, 10, 20,000 bucks uh, on, uh, on buying a new car, particularly if your property prices are coming down very fast. Which they are. So it, it suits social and domestic policy. It suits your pollution problem because you can't, you know, if you have ICEs, you're going to get more and more pollution, which gives you bad health and so on. So the government has that. So everything that the government is doing is going in the same direction here. And if you, what they've done now is they've set out, you know, a number of test areas for autonomous vehicles and it's being run by the big cities. So we have some some pictures, for example, in Guangzhou, uh, which is one of the w- w- one of the wealthiest uh, a- areas, and they they, they not only have uh, AV taxi services, they have AV buses, but they also have um, AV cleansing machines. So the, the the machine that comes along and cleans the side of the road that is also now AV. So all of those trials are going through, and and this is the point that you you have to go through the trials, you have to learn. By, by doing in order to get your algorithms right and so on. You know, LIDAR, for example, is coming, is coming through. So, um, as a result of that, because you know, people looked at various ways. How do I do the mapping? How do I cope for curbsides? How do I cope for the mother with the baby? You know, what, 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 what do I need to build into the algorithm to do all this? Um, and so, you know, but China, as I say, is, is a couple of years ahead of Europe in this. And is you know is sort of three to four years ahead of the states. Although 
uh, hats off to GM. As I say, you, uh, GM, the cruise uh, uh, subsidiary, is now able to offer at the moment uh, GM uh, cruise employees can jump into a cruise car and travel around. Uh, GM CEO Mary Barra has got a very good video of her doing this. Uh, in, and it will be open in most parts of San Francisco by uh, probably by the end of the year, we, we reckon. So, uh, you know, it's, it's got to be carefully controlled. You don't want to have mistakes. You don't want to go down the Tesla route. Oh, yeah, you can do everything. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, go to the moon if you like. You know, uh, uh, people don't believe that kind of nonsense. So, you know, so slow, slow and steady wins the race here. And you can see that that's what the major companies are doing. So that's China. Paul, what are you seeing in Europe, a continent which has an advantage of, you know, wealthy population? So unlike China, they can afford uh, these somewhat expensive electric vehicles. Uh, I know adoption there was was the earliest. What trends are you seeing there, both in the terms of cyclical related to uh, uh, the, the recession there, as well as the war in Ukraine, but also just on the electrification front? So there's the, there's the big picture, uh, the, you know, a, a big fall off, no real recovery. I mean, what would you expect this year with Russia invading and so on? You know, you're effectively at war uh, here on the continent for the first time since 1945. Uh, energy prices have gone up dramatically in most because of oil and gas. You know, here in Portugal, our electricity prices haven't gone up. They've gone up two or three percent. Why is that? Because we're on renewables. You know, the best thing that happened to us was that France refused to support the idea of an LNG pipeline going through the Pyrenees. So we couldn't do that. So we had to do um, solar and wind and hydroelectric. And people go, oh, it's all very expensive. Of course it isn't. It's the cheapest form of energy. And once you've paid out, you don't have to keep paying because you've built the stations. You have to maintain the infrastructure, but that's it. And you don't have someone like um, like Putin coming along and pushing the price of oil up to a hundred bucks, or pushing the price of uh, of natural nat gas up to up, up to nine bucks, and so on. You know, you've got. Sorry, Paul. You're talking about so, wind or solar or nuclear or all three. I'm saying, I'm saying we're, we're talking, talking about the, the move to, I'm sort of trying to challenge the idea that everybody seems to think that renewables are somehow very expensive, and they're not. They're actually the cheapest form of energy. And, you know, and we are in, in Portugal, the proof of that. Uh, but, you know, most of what, what I was saying was that most of Europe, unfortunately, is still reliant on gas, Russian gas, which is not available anymore, by and large, and prices are high. So, you know, European economy is in major recession. Um, you know, the companies that I know are shutting down and they're saying, well, look, we're going to shut down till Christmas. And you talk to the CEO, you talk to the board members, and they say, well, we've, you know, we're saying till Christmas because something might turn up. We don't want to sort of distress people. But frankly, we can't say we're going to start up in the new year because there's no demand. Um, you know, you've got, you've, you've got, you've got a major crisis. But at the same time, the idea of, of autonomous vehicles is as important. And so the question is, will the European automakers be able to make the push or will they lose the market to the Chinese and possibly the Koreans? Because the Chinese are coming in now in quite a big way. And because their government supported, they've got money to do this. So it's, you know, the, the Europe is all to play for at the moment. It hasn't got the, the defences of a US market, if you like, and the in, internal strength. So it needs to move very carefully because it could easily go bankrupt. The automakers could easily go bankrupt here. You know, if you said to me, who are the ones most at risk? They are the auto, but because their, their, their ICE sales are very low. But if we do switch to the, uh, to the other chart, uh, Jack, and just look what's happening, yes. you know, you see massive volatility taking place in between diesel, gasoline, and you know, that chart there. So if you go back to 2014, 2015, and these are industry numbers, they're not made up by us or anything. Uh, so, you know, diesel was more than 50% of the market. Diesel is now down at 20% in just five or six years. You know, markets do move very, very fast. So in the short term, gasoline did well because hybrids and battery and plug-ins weren't there. But look at them now. They're moving up. Batteries and plug-ins are 20%. Hybrids are 20%. And, you know, gasoline is now being squeezed in the way that diesel was. And you know, if you can get to autonomous vehicles, then you will see a big, big shift. The others, by the way, is gas, LNG, 
which has taken off in, uh, in in Italy, but really nowhere else. And I, I think it's, it's not not going to go very much further. So we kind of know how the we know where the game is, but we don't yet know how it's going to turn out. And I would be quite quite reluctant to invest in any of the players at the moment because the risks of getting it wrong are really rather high. So uh, the, the the issue you've got that will define whether you go bankrupt or not is is twofold. One is what's your underlying income from the sale of ICEs over the next 12 to 18 months uh, at the first of the, over over the next three to five years if you're taking a longer term view because that's your cash flow that's all you've got uh, I don't think you can go back to shareholders unless you're very lucky to get large infusions of cash <clears throat> so what you've got is that and if you get that wrong if that those sales are lower then you have less to spend and you've got to obviously maintain your sales, you've got to put money into them, you've got to re refresh the lineup and everything else, but you've also got to put these tens of billions into developing your EV and AV line. So you've really got two lines like this. You've got a declining line of revenue and you hope, you know, yes, it's an increasing line of, uh, of, of, of spend, but you hope also that spend is going to start to give you an increasing amount of revenue from EVs and, and AVs. And you just hope that that happens before the uh, b before the lines cross. So, even though you think there's a lot of opportunity in Europe, and there have been an early adopter in electrification, you, you said you <coughs> wouldn't invest in a lot of the stocks of European companies that, of producing cars. That, that's very interesting. So, where do you see the opportunity on the investment side? If you don't like Tesla, uh, you, you don't necessarily uh, don't see a ton of opportunity in the European automakers. Uh, is it, are they the, the traditional automakers in the US, like Ford and GM, which are trying to catch up um, in electric? It, are they the Chinese ones? You mentioned Neo before, or, or are they the uh, kind of more speculative plays that have gone public via SPACs and uh, have, have drawn the, some attention from people who are focused on valuation, as well as a lot of attention from people who are not focused on valuation? Rivian comes to mind, um, uh, Lucid Motors as well. Uh, what is sort of your outlook on, on the different companies? Well, I, I, I think I would be cautious about this. And if I was going to play, you know, because there's, there's, if you go through a, a, a market cycle, what you find is you get high, a lot of hype and you know, everybody gets terribly excited about it. And actually, the hype is quite important because it wakes the market up. It wakes up the consumers and regulators and so on to think, oh, wait a minute, something is happening here. But most of the stuff that happens in the hype disappears. You know, if you go back to dot, uh, dot com uh, in 2000, you know, yes, Amazon just about survived, but that's because it had a very savvy finance director uh, who, who got a large amount of cash in just before the bottom fell out of the whole thing. Um, you know, pets.com and so on, which were the real, uh, you know, sort of uh, favorites of the time, disappeared very quickly indeed. Um, so what you've got is uh, companies, uh, you know, the place to look is in people who are already set up to supply the electric vehicle market and the autonomous vehicle market. So companies like uh, Aptiv, for example, and uh you know, I'm not making a recommendation on that because we don't do that. But just to say, <coughs> it's worth having a look at companies like that, which are expanding because they're already in the right place and could potentially, A, broaden out into autonomous vehicles as that happens, and B, obviously, uh, be a, uh, an acquisition target for uh, pe pe people like Borg Warner and, and so on. Uh, so, you know, the, you've got a lot of elephants trampling around uh, tra trampling the grass down, trying to work out what to do, knocking over quite a lot of trees as they go. Unfortunate if you're a tree, so be careful. Uh, unfortunate if you're a mouse and you get under the, the foot. But you know, if you can step step aside and be agile and light on your feet, as it were, uh, there are probably some opportunities here. I know there was a time when you were impressed by the European automaker Stellantis for its advances in electric vehicles as well as autonomous vehicles. What have you made of its recent progress? I know that they are maybe about to put out a very cheap electric car. Um, do you think they're going to be an elephant or a tree? I, I know. I, I think that they, you know, the, the, and this is this is the interesting thing because it, you know 
I'm pretty sure that electric vehicles will take over. I'm pretty sure that autonomous vehicles will come along after 2025 in a very big way. Um, you don't necessarily have to have to, to, to be an established automaker to, to make that happen. It, it can help. Um, and certainly under Mary Barra, GM and, uh, and Ford, um, Jim Farley are, 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 are doing, doing well there. Um, if you look at VW, what gives me pause for thought is you have Herbert Deese, who's clearly doing the right things, but the politicians and the owners of uh, you know, uh, Porsche and so on and the unions suddenly decide, oh, they don't like what he's doing and he's out. Now, you know, that's the kind of political uh, pressure that I was meeting, which gives the opportunity, as you say, for people like Atlantis and so on uh, to, to come, come through. I, I mean, I think France... Is a site is a is an interesting uh, opportunity here because um, essentially the you know Atlantis is 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 trying to make Europe go slower so that they can catch up. You know this is really how I put it. So they've got they've got less they've they, they've gone not, they've not gone as far as uh, as VW in getting to this point. VW will have to wait and see, but may have hit somewhat of a brick wall temporarily they'll tell you they haven't but it, it kind of you know there's there's writing on the wall that it might be there and so that does give Stellantis a bit of an opportunity because they understand that the transformation is a chance to do things differently and to start again the question is from what base and can they move fast enough what is what when you say the writings on the wall for VW folks are like, what were you referring to and I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not, I'm not doing this in any kind of sort of uh, a stock uh, recommendation either, either way. But of course not. Yeah. And, and really, really, what I'm trying to do is to to talk this through. What it, outside of st the stimulus area, we're now going back to the world of investment that I understand that I grow up in, where what you have to do is you have to look at the underlying state of play in the industry. You have to look at the the strategy of the car company in this case and how well they are putting developing it and implementing and what's the nature of their management team and if you get those three aligned you can be reasonably confident that at worst you won't lose your money uh, which is always the fundamental thing we were in that position with vw but we now are at the point where they have sacked the guy who was making the changes and yeah, of course he was bullnosed and so on and so forth, but he had to be, you know. Uh, you don't make those kind of changes that quickly and so on. So I'm I'm nervous that Deese has gone. I'm ner nervous that his bosses and the Porsche people really like expensive cars and they've put in the Porsche CEO to run it and so on. And, I, you know, are they really up for the fight with the unions that they're going to have and the fight with the politicians about, you know, we're going to shut this factory down? guys you know you do not go from one peak to another you go down and then you come back up again you go down into the valley the states is slightly different because they can reshore production so you've got some opportunities to say to the unions actually you know don't worry we're going to close this factory but we're going to be reshoring stuff that we were making in china and therefore uh you know that that may get you through if, if you manage that uh successfully and that could happen in europe and I'd like to see it happen, um, but um, I'm, I'm just raising the question mark about are the owners really committed to this? Do they understand that this is actually life and death or are they more concerned with their plaything Porsche, which is you know, really very small in the context of all of this? Paul, I want to ask you, um, Tesla it seems like the case that you are, are somewhat skeptical of, of Tesla's future performance is based on the fact that it's really all show when it comes to autonomous vehicles. And autonomous vehicles, that is the end game. Elec electric vehicles themselves is only a stepping stone to electric autonomous vehicles. Let's, I, I believe that you are right about autonomous vehicles. What if we set that aside and said, actually, it is really only electric vehicles that matter it, uh, and that it's about building a sustainable electric vehicle. If, if that were true, would you uh, be more of a 
uh, more more of a more of an optimistic view on Tesla because they are a kind of a market leader in terms of sales. I mean, they do they do do good numbers, right? In terms of, of sales. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's it's really your. Well, you're I mean, Musk, but Musk is a is a, is a hustler. I agree with and, you. Yeah, you know, and and he hustles and so on, and you know he's 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 got the big picture right. You know, he was talking very early on about electric vehicles. He got the name Tesla because of electrification and so on. Um, he got the idea of autonomous vehicles and so on. Fine. But he he then expanded the story to say, well, actually, we're going to be the only player in the world. And actually, we're going to be the people who not only do cars, but we also do lorries and trucks and we do taxis and we do all the whole whole market is going to be ours nobody else will be able to catch us and by the way by 2020 we're going to be doing level three and probably level four and you know certainly by and so on and so forth and and that's the point where it goes off track now what he does very successfully is he gets in billions of dollars to finance all this yeah and the problem is that he's got in all those billions of dollars and now we're getting back to a bit of reality. Well, you haven't got to level three, Mr. Musk. There's no sign of you getting to level three. It's actually very difficult to do this. You can't just do it by magicking it up. You can't even do it. And that's often when he did it, you know, when the, when, when the, all the manufacturing problems hit, you know, he went and he slept in the factory. And he got it right. And he sacked the people who he brought in. And he brought in people, you know, originally, and he brought in people who knew how to manufacture a car. You know, so, you know, it, it, it showed that he could do it, but that's not where his heart was. His heart was in the lovely big, and you know, I'm going to conquer the world. Yeah, thank you very much. But, you know, what about this, um, you know, th these accidents? You know, what's going on here? You know, what have you done to, uh, to fix your, uh, your algorithms and so on? Oh, don't, don't, you know, don't worry. So that's the problem. And the, the issue is on the way up, you meet the same people as on the way down. So on the way up, there were lots of people who raised questions and so on, and he shrugged them all off. Well, they haven't gone away with their questions and they didn't like being shrugged off. So now the questions are coming back in spades, if you like, and Musk hasn't really got any answers. And this idea, I say, report, reportedly, he's actually transferring software engineers from Tesla to Twitter. I mean, I'm sorry, this is, this is, this is complete nonsense. You know, you have a big problem with Tesla. You've got an opportunity, but a big problem because a lot of, lot of better equipped people are coming in to catch, catch up and eat your lunch. You know, you were there first, but first mover advantage only lasts so long. And if you know, if you know what you're doing and you can be a fast follower, a GM certainly looked to me like being that, then you know, you're in a good place. And I don't think he, I think he believes his own bullshit. You know? Yeah, I agree with you about the fundamental character of Elon Musk. I, I think that he is a brilliant marketer and he gets people mm. to believe in a vision. And as such, I mean, the stock was valued so highly in part because of mm. loose monetary conditions and everything, in part because of the strong fundamental um, you know, production numbers. Uh, they they sold a bunch of stock at the top, so they have billions of dollars in the bank, and you know they may not have that Ooh. problem that VW has of Ooh. going bankrupt. So again, no no Tesla lover over here. But um, yeah, yeah, what do you think about? Uh, so you said they they no longer have first mover advantage because people are coming for them. GM, where is that going to hit them? Is it going to hit them as they're going to be forced to lower prices because the demand isn't there? As Elon Musk will constantly remind people. And it, so far, it has been true that you know, Tesla doesn't have to advertise, doesn't have to pay for advertising. Elon Musk is kind of a walking advertisement. But um, uh, the biggest problem is just meeting the production numbers. Like the demand will always be there. Do, do you forecast that to well, be? If, 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 you look, if you look at what's happening in China, uh, the Chinese market is oversupplied. Um, you know, we note in the report, as, you know, it's, it's probably 20 million, uh, it's excess capacity of about 20 million cars. And Tesla, I mean, you know, commercially, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't have a personal view on this or vendetta or anything like that. I, I simply look at the market opportunity. And if I like it, I like it. And if I don't like it, I, I say so. But it's not a personal thing um, about us or anything else because you can't get into that in investment. Um, so it, what's happened in China is that the market is oversupplied. Uh, there's a, a lot. And, and the problem is that as your ICE sales go down, what do you do as a 
ICE car manufacturer. Do you give up? Of course you don't. You cut the price. You say, come on, you know, we just cut the price a bit. So now you've got a different pro value proposition for the buyer because you say, well, we've cut the price. So that takes account of the subsidy you're going to get for the EV. So now, you know, it's actually cheaper for you again to buy the ICE. Now, Tesla commercial people in China are very smart. They did a preemptive price cut. Right. So, you know, they're, they're, and, you, know every, you know, we're seeing more price cuts coming out now through through the market and so on. But they are they are keeping their nose ahead, if you like. But obviously, their profitability and so on is going down because it's you know, the if, if you've got the problem of a capital intensive industry like the car industry, like chemicals, so I know, I know it very well, is you can't just walk away. You've got a whole lot of cleanup costs going on and you've got a whole lot of investment there and you've got to pay people off and so on and so forth. You know, you spend billions on all this. So before you give up, you fight to the last dollar or the last remimbi or the last euro, you know, and you just try and go around and you pay your suppliers late and you collect more and you so but you so the you get into dog eat dog and that is going to hit Tesla. And you see if you if you're a CEO uh, who, like an established uh, sort of auto auto company, you're used to giving uh, investors a reasonable view of where we're headed, so that and I you know I've done this you know I've I've run major businesses talk to investors and so on and you're perfectly entitled to give a sort of optimistic upbeat thing you know if I was doing it up you know I, I could say well of course it doesn't look very good quarter one and first half of the year but you know we are prepared for it and obviously if things got better then we would benefit you know you could easily go for that um but if you've gone out they're all guns blazing everything's going to be fantastic we're taking over the world and then somebody says but mm, the world's a bit smaller than we thought and actually there's quite a few people coming after you that's a difficult position to hold mm -hmm. and so um, you know, you could easily, and, and as I say, they're, they're very big in China, but the Chinese government is pretty ruthless. You know, yeah. they wanted they wanted Tesla there for their own purposes. Now, what were their own purposes? Yeah, explain that, so, Paul. So, um, um, you know, China did not allow Google in in China. They did not allow uh, many other companies to go in China. What yeah. was it about Tesla that they said, actually, we want you here? And how long do you think Tesla continue to ha can have a good relationship with the Chinese government and benefit from being able to sell so many cars there? Well, you know, I, I can answer this on the basis of what we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years in the chemical industry, because, uh, you know, China decided that he wanted to go into the chemicals industry in a big way. It wasn't at all a player 20 years ago. It's now the biggest player in the world. And what it did was it invited uh, all the major Western players to come in and do one joint venture. And what that meant was they could understand the technology and they could understand even more the project management skills. You know, so those are the two things that they wanted. And very few of those companies actually went on to build do a second plant because the Chinese had got what they wanted. You see the same with um, with with, with uh, the bullet trains. Uh, there was a famous uh, famous moment, I think about 2006 or 2007, where the Japanese invented uh, bullet trains and the Japanese, I think, transport minister came to Beijing and the Beijing, the, the Chinese transport minister very proudly showed him all these bullet trains. And the uh, Japanese minister said, but they're not Japanese. They're, they're not Chinese. They're Japanese. No, no, no. We've made them Chinese. <laughs> you know, and, and so, so, so th 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 this is the risk. For, uh, for, for Tesla, that they show China how to do it. They allow them to go, you know, to gain five years of going up the experience curve because, oh, look, that's how these guys do it. You know, and if you were China, wouldn't you want a very deep pocketed West Coast guy to come in and, you know, tell you everything because he's very boastful. And if you ask him a question, he doesn't say, oh, I'm not too sure. I, I don't really cover that area. Yeah. Anyway. He, he, now, some of his answers may, may, may be bullshit because he doesn't really know, but you're going to get an awful lot of information out of him and from his, uh, you know, from, from carefully pumping his, uh, his his key managers there. And you can put in your own key managers alongside. 
you know, we've got to, we've got to support you here, Mr. Musk. You know, oh yeah, right. Oh, I see. Oh, the plan just happened to go to, uh, in, in the guy's pocket. Well, oh yes, I suppose. Well, he was trying to work at home on it. You know, it's very important to you know, be dedicated. You know, all of this stuff happens. And, uh, you know, so, you know, so, so, so that, yeah, that, that's why the Chinese do it. And that's, I mean, that's what the states did to Britain. Yeah. 60, 50, 50, 100 years ago, that's how countries overtake. They pinch what they can get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, uh, Paul, it's been great, great having you here, uh, listening to your, your insight on the autos market. Uh, would love to have you back sometime. Just, we didn't have time to, to get into Japan, Russia, India, Brazil, those other car markets where, uh, you know, Japan, you think of them as a technological leader and they mm -hmm. have been, but in, in, electric and autonomous vehicles, they actually are very late uh, to the party. Uh, but we're, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Uh, people can find you on Twitter at Paul Hodges one I want to remind folks listening to this that your report, the pH report, um, from which we got all of the charts that you've seen on the screen today, uh, for guidance, is, is a research partner of Forward Guidance. And uh, you can get $1,000 off to this research product if you uh, follow the uh, instructions in the link below. There's, you can reach out to Paul at phodges at new-normal.com. You can reach out to me at jack at blockworks.co. Uh, Paul, tell us a little bit about the new normal, uh, excuse me, the pH report. What do people get? I know they get a quarterly auto report, which we just got fresh off the press. Um, what else do they get? Well, I think they get they get two things. One is, as I say, we're going into a world which is a lot more complicated for investment uh, because we haven't got the meme stock. We're not doing the uh, Robin Hood anymore and, uh, and and just buy what we see on, on Reddit. We're going back to a world where investing is actually difficult. And you know, if you want to invest and make money on a consistent basis, you have to know about the industry. You have to know about the company and you have to know about the management. And so really, that's what we're trying to do in the report, in, you know, normally in 10 pages. It's a bit longer in, uh, in the quarterly. Uh, we, add, we add a few pages for the auto report. But essentially, what we're doing is we're looking for the things that really change investment. We're looking at what's actually happening in China. We're not writing the brokerage report that says, oh, go and buy China. And then once you've bought and paid them the commission, they couldn't care less. Oh, did we say that? Oh, I didn't know. No, I wasn't. Yeah, we don't. No. But we actually stick with, I think. So we talk about China. We talk about energy. We talk about these really big issues, which, you know, you have to understand in detail. Now, you may not agree. You know, I mean, you know, we're, um, our corporates and so on who's, who subscribe, we have some of the biggest corporates and investment banks in the world subscribing to us. Often they will have additional information that we don't have. So they can go through the logic and say, yeah, I understand that, but we actually know that that bit is wrong. That's fine. That's why it's one, you know, nobody claims to be 100%. But what they also say is the reason we subscribe is sometimes we walk it through and we think we don't agree with that conclusion. But when, when, when we go through the logic, we say, actually, your logic is right. So that's why I say investing is, is difficult. We're doing two things, therefore. We're helping you become a better investor which I think is, is, is a very important thing at this particular moment. And we've been right. Or, you know, we have our sentiment indicator. We have our false dons. We've been absolutely right all year about the downward path of the S&P and the NASDAQ. We've been absolutely right about the problems of inflation and so on, when other people haven't been anywhere close. So you know, we've, we've done very well on interest rates and so on. So we're very good at those fundamentals. But, and we're also looking at these industries and saying, well, where are the opportunities here? And of course, also, very important in today's down market, well, where are the bear traps that you need to avoid? Absolutely. And the PH report, it's not only an acronym for, for your initials, but it also stands for a litmus test for the global economy because the chemicals market tends to be a leading indicator. So you saw a lot of these supply chain issues uh, in 2021 that later caused the inflation that we saw in 2022. Mm -hmm. Likewise, over the you know past few months and really this, this year, you've been seeing a lot of deflationary trends in the chemicals market that perhaps could harbor disinflation, or maybe they don't do anything to inflation, but they just cause a recession. Uh, either way, Paul, I, people for people if they want to know more about the chemicals market, they should watch our interview that aired roughly a month ago. I believe the title I gave to that was "The Chemicals Market Is Stupendously Bearish." Uh, did scream, I screaming, I, screaming, I, screaming recession? You said, yeah, screaming, screaming recession. recession. Was I a, too dramatic? Well, by, by, or, or was that actually accurate? 
Well, let, 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 me, let me tell you a story uh, which is in the public domain. Yesterday, one of the biggest polyethylene producers in the world in Saudi Arabia, who've got almost the best feedstock position in the world, a very low cost base, open door into China, a company called Yansab, very big company, been around a long time, good management, part of Sabic, uh, part of therefore Aramco, announced that because of lack of demand in China, it was shutting for 53 days. Now, that tells me the Chinese economy is in a far worse state than most people are admitting to in, uh, in, in on Wall Street. And if the Chinese market has been the growth engine for the global economy for the last 10, 12 years, if it's negative and badly now, I mean, shutting down, you know, for, for basically for two months, two months is, you know, uh, this is incredible, this is an incredible uh, drop because if they can't sell, what about all the companies in the States? You know, the state, state spent $200 billion on new capacity in polyethylene, the same product to export to China. Well, you know, this, this Houston, we have a problem. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not at all wor worried about your heading. I would have headline, I, I would have told you if I was. Um, but, you know, pe people are, are not prepared for the depth of the recession that we're going to see. And they're, they're looking at oil and gas and so on. I mean, and they're, the, the issue is we've only just started on the winter season. The winter season started about a week ago. So, yeah. Europe did a very good job on getting its stocks high and so on, but we don't know what the weather is going to be. And if the weather, we're not getting any more, more gas from Russia in, uh, in, 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 in Europe. So what we've got is what has to survive. Now, if we have a mild winter, fingers crossed, toes crossed and everything else, we'll get through to March with no problem. But we don't know what the weather is going to be. And if we have heavy weather um, and we have ships delayed or whatever, um, that, you know, normally, normally a market looks at risks and it prices risk. It does not price everything going perfectly. And that's the problem that we've got into with stimulus that, you know, oh, yeah, everything's always perfect because the Fed put is there and they'll always ride to the rescue. And what's happening, of course, is that you know, the Fed isn't able to rise to the rescue anymore. So, you know, this is why it's difficult times. And that's why the chemical industry is such an important indicator. Because what we're seeing today, everybody else will see in three months' time. That's so true, Paul. Another correct a prediction that you made that turned out to be true much earlier this year, maybe February or March, I said, will Europe be able to secure enough energy for, for the next year? And you said, you know, I'm somewhat optimistic. Schultz uh, can import a lot of LNG. And I was, to be honest, a little bit skeptical of that claim. So far, you were actually true. They were able to export, import, mm. excuse me, a tremendous amount of liquefied natural gas, mm. so much so that liquefied natural gas, the liquefied version, has actually collapsed. Just, I mean, ships are just waiting at the ports. Um, yeah. However, we'll, we'll see if that will be enough. And the fact that you're now a little bit more worried about it, when the mainstream narrative is not as worried about it, that I'm definitely paying attention to that. Also, Paul, just, you, you paid attention to uh, the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabian company that is having problems uh, exporting those chemicals, that shows it's a demand side because Saudi Arabian oil is extremely cheap. So it's not as if, oh, the price of oil is, is, yeah. is making up to it. it. It shows it's a demand problem. Paul, my final question is, and of course, this is not investment advice at all, but what are some publicly traded stocks that are chemical uh, uh, stocks? Because I feel like it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty niche industry. I guess, I suppose there's Dow Chemical or maybe there's also Huntsman, but what, who are the other global majors when it comes to the chemical industry and particularly with you with the exposure uh, uh, to the sectors uh, uh, that you Dow, Dow Chemical, Lion Del Barzell, uh, ExxonMobil have got quite a big uh, chemicals business. A lot, a lot of the oil companies have very big uh, chemical and refining uh, businesses. Uh, so, uh, you know, Chevron, Philips, ExxonMobil uh, and, 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 so, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, you've got uh, ar around the world, you've got people like Sabic, uh, now part of, of Aramco, uh, you've got uh, BASF, uh, the uh, the German uh, major. You've got uh, Total, of course, in France. You've got Arkema, uh, Covestro, uh, selling polyurethanes and polycarbonates. You know, quite a variety. SK in uh, in Korea, a uh, lot of Japanese uh, majors, Marabeni, Mitsubishi, and so on. So it's quite a diverse uh, diverse industry, and you know there's 
it's diverse in what they're doing, diverse in the way that they do it, and diverse in how well they do it. Uh, so this is why it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. But we're in this shift, really, where until, you know, a few years ago, we've been a supply driven business, you know, the baby boom, a super cycle. If you can build it, they will come. You know, we remember the, uh-huh. the baseball movie, uh, Field of Dreams. Uh, now it's much more around demand because you've got aging populations. So demand is lower and therefore you've got to, you've got to do a, a shift. So instead of looking over your shoulder there at what's going on, with, oh, you've got to start going, well, what's the, what's the customer doing here? You know, no. uh, what's, ha- what's happening in the auto industry? What's happening in the housing industry? What's happening in the retail industry and so on? And, uh, and, you know, that, 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 you know, it, 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 that's why it's always interesting because you're, you're in the middle of these value chains and one day you've got to be looking at this and the other day you've got to be looking at that. There we go. Fascinating stuff. Paul Hodges, thanks so much. Uh, talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you so much for watching. A few housekeeping items before I let you go. Subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube channel so you don't miss another episode of Forward Guidance. Uh, You can find Forward Guidance, the podcast you just listened to, on your favorite podcast app. That's Apple Podcast, Spotify, Overcast, Podbean. Uh, That's Podbean as in, on this pod, I've been saying that the Fed pivot is still far away. In addition, please check out today's sponsor. It really helps the show. Link is in the description. Thanks for watching.